Lion Boy, Chapter 15. Charlie led the circus parade that evening when, at Macomo's insistence, he had pretended to try to get on the young lion's back. The young lion had turned round and swiped at him viciously, leaving a great scratch down the side of his face. It hurt a lot. Later, he'd apologised. He hadn't meant to do it so hard. But it put Macomo off for the moment, and that was what mattered. So instead, clad in red velvet, gold braid and black boots that shone like polished licorice, Charlie walked beside the lions, who were tethered with heavy, heavy chains to a great metal bar that rolled behind them. Ring boys danced ahead to clear the way, and the rest of the circus gave them plenty of room behind. The crowds gasped and flinched when they saw the great six beasts and the brown boy walking amongst them. They led the entire circus along the riverbank, past the island with the great cathedral of Notre Dame, where the hunchback lived, down the Rue de, v de Rivoli and past the Tuileri Gardens to the Place de la Concorde, down the Champs-Élysées on, on to the Arc de Triomphe. Then he led them back again, the zebras, the horses, the learned pig pulling the twills in twins in a little chariot, the Hungarian wearing his performing bees as a beard, the dancing girls and the bearded lady, pirouette and the cowboys and Major Tib on his fancy black stallion, the Lucidi family turning somersaults and cartwheels, and the band in their plain blue suits playing all the show tunes and marches in their repertoire. Drums were rolling, saxophones were parping and glinting in the sun. They all called out, sang and handed out handbills. They were pretty tired when they got back to the ship, but as Major Tim said in his speech, when they returned, now everyone in Paris knows that we're here. They'll come and they'll also bring all the friends. Then when everyone went to bed, Charlie tried again to go out and check the route to the station, but again Macomo called him back. I'm tense, boy, he said. I've been throwing up. Massage my neck. So Charlie had to rub Macomo's strong, wiry neck and shoulders. Everyone felt tense. Tomorrow, the premiere, the big one, the first night. Excitement and anticipation roiled and coiled round the ship like vines, like smoke. Tomorrow, at last, they'd be doing the show. Charlie felt tense too, but he knew what he had to do, and that made him calm. In the meantime, despite everything, Raffi, his parents, Macomo, Allergenes, the imminent escape. He was really, really looking forward to seeing this show. Because he had never seen the show before, Charlie was allowed by Major Tibb to join the ring boys, who crouched right at the ringside, at the bottom of the aisles and through the seating, ready to jump up and clear up between the acts. Of course, when the lions came on, Charlie would have his own work to do, but in the meantime, he could just squat down there and watch. First came the audience, and what a crowd. They came rolling down the cobbled ramp from the Place de la Bastille to the quayside, and they were glorious. Swanky ladies in big skirts, fat men in white waistcoats with sashes, medals and tailcoats. Dangerous-looking fellows in long, dark coats and high boots. Children, mothers, fathers, skaters and punks. Tough-looking big boys in worn leather trousers and a gaggle of beautiful young girls carrying balloons, flowers and presents, laughing and obviously celebrating something. Red-faced people from all over the country, soldiers, a priest. They were all of colours. They all spoke languages, all languages, some of which Charlie recognised. English and French, of course, and some Arabic. Others might have come from Mars. Charlie peered around, looking to see if he could see a lady who might be a tiger trainer, who even, if she wasn't actually wearing the leather skirt, looked as if she might, but no one stood out. The Imperial Ambassador's party had taken over the great box and they were the grandest and the smartest of all. Major Tibb was up there with them, shaking hands and clicking his heels, kissing the hands of the ladies. With a calliope creaking away, lucky it wasn't too noisy inside the ship, and the gabbling of the crowd as they settled into their seats, the smell of the fresh sawdust from the ring and the gentle glow of the yellow lights shining down. Charlie wished that he had no troubles, 
that he could just be an excited kid at the circus. The music was fading now and the chattering of the crowd faded too. The lights began to dim and a hush fell over the ring, over the ranks of people looking down on it and over the performers waiting behind the curtains for their moment to come and dazzle the crowds. Darkness fell in the big top. There was a long moment of silence. The audience seemed to breathe as one in the dark and then a drum roll broke out, loud and bright. At the exact moment that the band broke into a gay gallop, swirling sweeping spotlights in different colours appeared way up above and cast their rays about the ring. Garlands and paper streamers fell from the roof in twirls of colour and a troop of scarlet and yellow clad tumblers began to leap and bolt and vault from the four entrances of the ring into the centre. One by one, they hurtled in from different directions, lit up by the spotlights, bouncing off their hidden springboards and somersaulting onto the mattresses in the middle. They missed each other by inches, it seemed, and then leapt up, bowing and grinning, ran back into the shadows at the edge of the ring to come bouncing in again. Some beautiful ponies were brought on and the tumblers bounced right over them, landing safe as cats was arching their bodies, flinging their arms back in delight at their own cleverness. As the acrobats took their bows, bending in the middle and dropping their heads to the knees, or doing the splits as if they were a piece of rubber, Major Tim came striding into the ring. He had a blue, bright spotlight of his own. He got up in his midnight blue tailcoat, shining gold buttons, white breeches and black leather riding boots. He was holding his long elegant whip and in ringing tones he proclaimed, ladies and gentlemen, madame and monsieur, welcome to de Boyde's Royal Floating Circus and the Equestrian Philharmonic Academy. This is the show of shows and the night of nights. Tonight for your education, your temporary perturbation and your ultimate satisfaction, we have the pleasure, the honour, the unparalleled order to bring you the show which you have all been waiting for. And the... His voice was as fine as as round as a bell. He told the crowd what acts would appear and how fabulous they'd be. He cracked his whip, he blew his whistle, he threw back his manly shoulders and twirled his dashing moustache. All the men in the audience rather wished they were a little bit more like him. And all the ladies in the audience rather wished that their boyfriends and husbands were too. Charlie could see that the ring boys, meanwhile, were sweeping up the streamers and garlands, pulling up the leapers' mattresses out of the ring, and in the darkness, while from the spotlight, Major Tib extolled the magnificence of the show that was about to start. It started up with twelve zebras waltzing in rows of three to a beautiful tune. It was called Zizou's Waltz. Their plump little bodies, glossy and fat, and their strangely ancient-looking heads adorned with black and white plumes. They bent their stripy knees to in and fro him, making the prettiest stripy black and white patterns as they crossed and they recrossed each other. Then the lighting changed colour, which changed the colour of their white stripes and they made pink patterns, then blue, then green, then a mist slid out over the ring from a dry ice machine and the zebras arranged themselves in a circle all facing inwards they bowed to each other and carefully laid down as the mist rose covered them for all the world as if they were going to sleep and the beautiful sad tune was taken up by a lonely saxophone the lights turned to the inside of the great striped roof of the big top snow was falling from the roof but going up too swirling Oh, and it wasn't snow. The flakes were too big. It was fluttering doves, all different colours, and rose petals falling and floating. Everyone gazed. Entrance at the doves and the petals swirled and settled around the sleeping zebras. Not even Charlie noticed what was going on. Meanwhile, up in the flies, the wire guys had been preparing the next act, which Major Tib came back out to introduce. Ladies and gentlemen, he roared, tonight, ce soir, here in Paris, at the Royal Floating Circus and the Equestrian Philharmonic Academy, you are about to witness the wonderful. 
You are about to experience the exceptional. You are about to be implicated in the impossible. For tonight, Madame and Monsieur, we have with us for your amusement and astoundment the one, the only, the world famous, the unique and the irreplaceable devil of the air, El Diablo Aero. The man who can live his entire life on a wire as thin as your neck chain, madam. Here he gestured magnificently to a lady in the front row, and as high as the regard in which the imperial ambassador holds his wife. Here he gestured magnificently towards the great box, and carried on without taking a breath. In short, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give you El Diablo Aero. Way up in the big top, the wire was stretched taut, as taut as a guitar string across the expanse of the empty space. And at one end there was Aero, looking quite superb in a silver leotard with silver legs, holding his long, drooping, balancing pole and pointing one of his toes with inexpressible elegance. First he just stood there for a while, he's just looking fabulous. Then he ran along the wire, just to show it who was boss. Then he danced along it, hopping and skipping, and he kicked off his shoes. Then two girls came out to join him. They were also in silver leotards, and they were also blindfolded. He trotted across the wire, and he put them into a wheelbarrow, and he wheeled them across. He got out a little stove, and he cooked an omelette up there, flipping it like a pancake. And then they made a big hoo-ha in inviting a fellow up from the audience. In fact, one of the Imperial Ambassador's party was very keen to come, so he was helped into the ring, trying to look tough and confident, and then he climbed up the rope ladder to the flies. Then when he reached the platform, El Diablo Aero had a word with him. He hitched him up onto his back and carefully but gently carried him piggyback over the high wire to the tiny platform on the other side. Charlotte was consumed with envy. But now what? Instead of bringing him back again, El Diablo had scampered back across the high wire, leaving the fellow stranded. There was no rope ladders on the other side. Indeed, there was absolutely no way down. El Diablo and the twins were laughing. But goodness knows what the Imperial Ambassador's guest thought. Charlie bit his knuckle. El Diablo was gesturing to the man to walk back across, but the fellow, seemingly in good humour, was shaking his head and Jester in absolute nowhere. El Diablo beckoned to his reluctant guest, but he would not be moved. Finally, he took hold of a violin and began to play a sad but beautiful tune, full of minor chords crunched against each other like the beating of a broken heart. Indeed, he played so tragically that most of the people forgot he was standing on a high wire. He was way, way up in the air, trying to tempt a member of the audience to walk the high wire in his turn. Even danger itself is dazzled by how beautiful and clever these circus guys are, thought Charlie, and so it forgets to knock them down or break their necks or have a tiger bite their heads off. But now a clown had entered the ring, imitating El Diablo Aero, Julius's dad. There he was, elegant with white face makeup, claws in a mischievous manner. He was playing his gigantic fiddle behind his back, throwing somersaults with it, playing it between his legs and running up to the top of a three-metre ladder to play duet with El Diablo. Still up on his high wire, he was trying to lure the man across. By the time they were all down in the ring again, the music had turned bright and parping. And then suddenly, the chimps drove in on bicycles. They were all wearing beautiful white silky pyjamas, they were wearing white turbans with a peacock feather attached by a jewel at the front. The bicycles were peacock blue. They did somersaults and carried each other around, waving parasols and pretending to smoke pipes. They picked up the rose pedals from the ground and they gave them. They gave them to the members of the audience and then two of them got into an argument and began eating the roses. The clowns were all still lacking about like nobody's business. Here we are again, all of a lump, they cried. How are you? Major Tib came in after them. If you please, Major Tib, 
said one of the fat ones. He says that you that you said, that I said, and that they said, nobody had said nothing to nobody. Julius's dad, meanwhile, set up a tiny little high wire and had rats running along it, dancing and stopping to eat the chocolates that he was feeding them. Who needs to cook? He was saying, cooking's fancy, cooking's just showing off. And he gave one of the rats his mobile phone, said it was ringing for a takeaway. And then he was trying to invite one of the ladies from the audience to join him for dinner and paying her extravagant compliments. Then when it's not been dangerous, it's just daft, Charlie thought. What a funny mixture. Then in a rush, he remembered that this, the rats on the, on the high wire, that was his cue. He leapt up to his feet, his heart was pumping like a piston. And feeling proud and glad, he vaulted into the ring. He knew exactly what to do. And so, like a professional, he began to pull the polished levers and wind the well-worn handles that would bring down the ring cage. The next act was Macomo and the Lions. Charlie had wondered how he would feel about watching the Lions perform. He knew what they'd do. He'd seen it often enough in rehearsal. But it'd be different to see them do it in front of a crowd, as if they were, as if that's all they could do. And if Macomo were incredibly brave and clever to have taught them to roll on the floor, and let him pick up their paws and to roar when he'd told them to, as if they weren't really incredibly much cleverer than this, and they were only humouring Macomo because he fed them, and because he'd fed them drugs. More to the point. Charlie had thought he would find the whole thing a bit humiliating for them and maybe a little bit embarrassing. But he didn't, far from it. He was enchanted by how strong and how graceful his friends were as they entered the ring, staring down their snooty noses as they leapt around the ring. Macomo looked wonderfully stern and brave in his long African robes with his rhino whip, taking the lions by the paws and making them roar throwing their strong bodies down onto the ground and lying on top of them. When he turned his back on the young lion for a moment, Charlie genuinely feared for his safety. When he harnessed the oldest lion to a small chariot and stepped into it to drive him, for a moment Charlie feared even more because he knew what Macomo did not and that was the oldest lion had regained his dignity and would not be caring for this humiliating treatment any more. But the oldest lion had also regained his intelligence and he knew that in order to escape later he had to be obedient now so he put up with it even though he hated it all this charlie could see in his beautiful old furry face the lions pretended to fight and macomo separated them to gasps and shrieks from the more nervous members of the audience and finally the lionesses did a magnificent, effective trick called the bounce. It used to be done in the old days, before there were ring cages, and in, theirs, and in those days, wagging cages had to be rolled into the ring. The trainer would go inside the cage with the lions, and they would bounce around on the cage's walls, running up one wall, and then down the other, and so on. Now the band broke into a special lion tune. The lionesses leapt up the side of the ring cage not holding on with their claws but bouncing from cage to ground and then up the wall of the cage again it was like a wall of death or like a kitten on the back of a sofa the audience shrieked to have the great cats leap towards them and to hear the metal rattle and shake as the great weight of the animals crashed against it to hear the grounds to see the lioness's great paws and their sleek creamy bellas it was fantastic, it was terrifying, and it was magnificent. This was the circus. Then came the interval. Charlie was mighty glad. Between being in the audience and being in the show, and being constantly, silently, nervously aware of what he had to do later, he already felt exhausted. He was also exhilarated and overwhelmed, and it were only halfway through. After that, well... He couldn't think about afterwards yet. As soon as he had stowed the ring cage and helped Macomo to settle in the lions, he just had time to sit quietly for a moment or two on deck, breathing deeply, watching the, mu 
the moon with her calming stare and reassuring himself that yes, that rope attached to the bows was the one down which they were going to run. They were going to avoid any crowds at the gangplank and yes, yes, they could get to the bridge quickly. And yes, it was all patchily lit and the moon was not so big as to catch too much light. But yes, it was all doable and they were going to do it. He wished he'd been able to check the route all the way, but he had seen how the towpath led all the way to the river. So as long as they weren't spotted, how complicated could this be? When Macomo went to get himself a cup of coffee from the refreshment stall, Charlie got his bag from the rope locker. He made sure that his few possessions were in there. The phones, the letter in blood, his medicine, his tiger, his knife, his mum's, pre his mum's presents. He looked at his phone. Ha <laughs> ha, Rafa, he thought. You didn't know where I was, did you? You didn't come and get me. He stood as well the bits of food that had been saving from the last few meals and the packages of meat he had purloined from the meat store for the lions. He just hoped it wouldn't leak in his bag. It was all quite heavy, but the lions could help carry. He felt very, very excited. And that's the end of chapter 15.